This episode is brought to you by Indie Insights, our bi-weekly newsletter and love note to independent film. Inside, you'll find tools, tips, and tricks vetted by industry professionals, independent films that will inspire your creativity, filmmaking events where you can rub elbows with filmmakers just like you, and so much more. The best part of it all, it's absolutely free. All you have to do is go to www.banzai.film forward slash subscribe. And within a few clicks, you'll be part of our newsletter community. Again, that's www.banzai.film forward slash subscribe to get Indie Insights, a free bi-weekly newsletter from Chris and Nick at Bonsai Creative. You're listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps creatives in film get where they're going faster by sharing the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives across the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley, and with me today is my good friend and Make It podcast co-host, Nicholas Bugs. Hello, hello, Chris here with another episode of the Make It Podcast. And here with me in this conversation is my co-founder and good friend, Nicholas Bugs, and our esteemed guest, Frank Monteleone. Frank, Nick, say hello. You first, Nick. (laughs) See, there you go. (laughs) What's up, folks? It's good to be here as usual. It's awesome to have a guest today. Uh, I think these guest conversations are so cool, and it's just so awesome to have frank with us today so frank you're up man yeah i love being here with you guys uh like i said i'm a lifelonger after uh you know hearing you guys and everything you're about and so i'm 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 really uh i'm I'm excited for this time together i love it can you tell the people sort of a little bit of background on on who you are what you've been up to speaking of your your history in film yeah. So my name is Frank Monteleone. Uh, I'm a filmmaker. I run uh, and founded Full Armor Films. I've had it since about 2005. We started in New York, started as a one man wrecking crew up there and doing commercials and working up there really with the eye on narrative. We got into full post production, moved out to LA, did post production for a long time, and then realized development is where I wanted to be on the front end and then became a full fledged development house. And now we went from New York to LA to New Orleans, and now we're based out of New Orleans. Is that where you're at right now? Are you in New Orleans? So it looks like it. New Orleans. <laughs> this, I'm actually traveling right now. <laughs> I mean, this is Chicago behind me. Yeah, Chicago. I love Chicago. Yeah. yeah nice. So it's nice and crisp here. Are you a deep dish guy? <laughs> yeah. Like, are you going? Or like, or do you do that pizza? Or are you more like a an Italian? Sandwich yeah, I guy. feel like, like wait, wait, Italian. wait, 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 wait a second, Ital- wait a second, yeah, yeah. Chris. What are you, what are you talking about, Italian, bro? Don't they have <laughs> those Italian? The question, no, 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 no. Italian- the question is either no. The question is whether or not he's a deep dish Chicago or if he's a Sicilian. You know what I'm saying? I get it straight. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Come on. Okay, man. I like yeah, the you know? question. I like that. <laughs> right. You know. Well, I, I was gonna say my answer is I feel like I feel like if I'm doing Chicago deep dish, I'm I'm a traitor to the New York. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the New York pizza that uh, I feel like I grew up in, you know, down in New York. So, yeah, it's true. Gotta, I'm headed to New York, that's awesome. like doing the whole Christmas in New York thing. And having had both of those pizzas, I have to tell you, man, I, I, oh. I'm i a New York guy. I, I like a little bit thinner yeah, crust. Yeah. I don't like all that dough. The, the, the deep dish is good that first time. And yeah. then you're like. It'll wreck your whole day, man. man. It just, yeah, it's, 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 it like, slows you down. Oh, yeah, no, I, I'm, <laughs> right. I'm a sucker for deep dish. It's great, but just so New York Joe and Pat's Pizza. Most people don't know it because they mm. hit up the other Joes, but there's a Joe and Pat's Pizza, 1957. Mm. Uh, it's yeah, that'll wreck your world. I'm writing, writing down. down. I went to Joe's, yep. but I might have went to the wrong one. I went to the one. I, there's one in Times Square, right? Like right yeah, outside yeah, Times Square. I went to that one. It was yeah, that's the one everybody goes to, man. Uh-huh. 
right? Yeah, that's yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> speaking, speaking of food, nope. Nick, how, how was your this? This is just so for posterity. We're recording this at the end of November, November thirtieth. How how was your Thanksgiving, sir? Oh man, mine was great. I mean, there was also like I think we mentioned this before. Like I don't do the turkey. I thing wanted to, I wanted like, you to cash hey, the check gonna, on I, our no, promise to I the know. audience that you were going to explain why you. <laughs> Exactly. Aren't just, American. It's just dry, bro. Like generally speaking, <laughs> it's just dry. Like if I had my options, right? Do you go for the dry turkey or you go for the ham? And my dad always kills the ham. Like he makes a mm-hmm. ham that, like, you just you would literally. I'm just telling you this right now. You would walk up to your mama and you slap your mama <laughs> after you have this ham, right? <laughs> so I know my mom hates when my dad makes ham. So Shout so out to it's senior great. Rugs. Yeah, yeah, but this year he was not well and he didn't make oh, the right. ham. So, yeah, so we had turkey that was made by my in-laws and I have to say they did it, man. They hooked it up. They smoked one. They did something else. Like they hooked it up. It was delicious. We had that. We had salmon, like all the different things and they hooked it up. I can't, I can't complain. My wife made a little, um, was it a sweet potato souffle? You know, you got to put that little, I love sweet potato you know, souffle. That, that, that's so good. There you go. Put the little marshmallows on the top. Man, I'm over here. You know, doing one of these. Like, why are you gonna be talking about food? <laughs> so, yeah, I hear, that, I hear there's good. no better way to do a turkey. And look, my, my Thanksgiving was great. I had just a convivium of meats and fake meats and <laughs> <laughs> sides and, and, and vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, 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 wait. Uh, and Frank, now <laughs> I, I'm a language guy. I'm a words guy, right? But I'm going to have to go look up convivium and then we're going <laughs> to. I'm like, what? And then I'm going to have to put that in the show notes so everybody else can understand what the heck that is. Got a nice he didn't even use cornucopia. Like, yeah. No yeah, yeah, I think uh, Frank, Frank, I honestly thought like everybody uses cornucopia at Thanksgiving. Yeah, and the Hunger Games is out, so I thought, don't use cornucopia. <laughs> <laughs> don't use cornucopia. Figure out another word to use, and so yeah, I went convivium. Yeah, you went convivium. Yeah. Kill me, yeah. kill me. Let's do it. Let's get- <laughs> anyway, it it was great, and I'll tell you what. I heard that the best way to have a turkey is to spatchcock it. And years ago, I heard that word, and the first thing I thought was, "This is what happens when you get plaster in your crotch." I had no clue it had anything to do with turkeys, like spatchcock. Spatchcock. But it, it is apparently like the new fried turkey. Like, you know, a fried turkey had its moment. Yeah. This is this is yeah, where yeah. this is where we're at. So all right, let's get into some film talk. There's a lot going on in the world. We can take this anywhere you want to go, but I do want some uh, uh some background, at least on full armor. Oh, what yeah. that process was like just to get uh the company started. And to take that leap of faith to say, this is it for me. I am going to be someone who is doing film, working in film, whether it be the commercial space, cinema space, whatever. Mm-hmm. What was that like for you? I, I, I assume you had some doubters in your family, maybe? Yeah. I mean, doubters. I, I kind of always was one growing up, growing up knowing I was always going to be in this space, I was always going to be an actor. I was always going to be with movies and that was going to be the pursuit, uh, since I was really young. So I went to school for it, went to college for it, for acting in theater actually. And then, um, but I was always making films all the way through. So I was always teaching myself. And, um, whenever we had to put something on stage, I was making a, a film version of it. So, uh, by the time I got out really, you know, full armor came out of desperation. You know, I needed a job. Mm. Uh, I went to college in New York, friends of mine. Uh, I went to actually high school down in Florida at a creative arts college, um, high school. And then um, their advice was go to the city you want to live in after. And so it was between uh, New York and LA. And I was going to go, I was looking at LA, I applied both ways. And then New York, uh, I decided to go to uh, just for the acting side of things. And I would keep pursuing film on the side. And so by the time I graduated, I needed a job. I was I was, you know, shuffling manila envelopes, trying to apply to every production <laughs> company. I was hitting up every production that was shooting in and around New York and, uh, I didn't get one response. So I did what every practical person would do is I printed my own business cards, <laughs> printed yeah. my own stuff. And I started going around knocking on doors. And so it really came out of a place of desperation. But like, as you said, you know, I, I wanted to keep making no matter what. So, 
uh, that was the birth. I was a kind of a one man wrecking crew, as we said, like a, a predator, you know, I was yeah. able to produce, edit and direct and just put it up. I love that. Nice. That's awesome, man. It, that it's probably it's two things, right? It's the desperation that you mentioned, but it's yeah. also, you knew from a young age, this is what you were going to do. So it wasn't just a matter of how you were going to do it and whether or not someone was going to give you the opportunity mm-hmm. or if you were going to take the opportunity and you took it. And that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Was there a moment where you knew you were actually good enough to, to be successful at it? I know you've been an actor in, uh, in a few things, Queen Sugar for a couple episodes, Focus, uh, Bull. You've gotten this acting work. And when you were talking just then, I was reminded of a, of a friend of ours, uh, former guest, Joshua Bermudez. Um, he, he might, I think he might have changed his, his name. He might have a pseudonym now, Nick, but, but we he know does. him as Joshua Bermudez. Uh, <laughs> yeah. he, he gave me, he, some great advice on, on what he teaches actors. Cause he had a course as well, like a class. And he would basically say, I put an actor in an empty room and see what they do with their hands. Hmm. Cause most people that are new to acting think they have to do something with their hands or don't know what to do with their hands or don't know what to do with their body. Like if they find a wall, they will lean on it. If they have pockets, they'll stuff their hands in it. Um, what do you think about that? Is that, does that resonate with you? Like how, how would you know someone is connecting from a craft standpoint as an actor? And how did you see that in yourself? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. I mean, that's, it's, um, it's interesting because um, I think if, you know, just the idea of putting yourself alone in a room, he's really onto something because I think most of the work that gets done, uh, you know, at least from the acting standpoint, and really you could say this from any creative spot is really what you do in the dark, you know, what you do alone, mm-hmm. what you do, in yeah. the, you know, the studio, if you will. And so to have eyes on that, you know, you can really observe that, but um, you know, that's what, what my background is Shakespeare. I, I went out to Oxford. I studied out there. So theater was really my background. And I remember we would just lock ourselves in studios to get off book, you know, yeah. on Shakespeare, like, and it would just, cause it would t- take you hours and it's really that space. Um, so I think, I think it's just being alone with yourself, you know? And I think that's what he's really hitting with. Uh, and then can you bring you, uh, to the table with that's the, the toughest thing, performance, right? you know? And then that, if you can sit with yourself long enough in the dark to find that authentic, you know, whatever you're bringing in the creative, uh, you know, from, I mean, this is kind of true from writing to, to acting as well. But if you, from acting particular, if you can bring yourself authentically, then usually you see something that's worth working on and continuing. I had this friend named Scott Kimry that got me into film and Nick, you might've heard the story before in the past. I know you know who Scott is. Scott is, is shout out to Scott Kimry. If you're listening to this for whatever reason, I love you. And you inspired me to be in film, um, yeah. whether you know that or not, but <laughs> He would uh, he would always talk about these parties he would throw where you would have to pick a character in advance and then be that character like all night long. Um, oh. And that's a game. I think that's a game that has a name. I can't remember the name of it. But the twist I think that he would have on it is, is like someone else would pick your character for you or mm. you'd have to pick a character out of a hat. So you didn't have a chance to prepare to be sort of that that person. And I think that's an interesting and weird way sort of to learn how to bring yourself into the character because on, on one hand you're pretending, but on the other hand it's real life. Yeah. Like if you pick sex worker, how's that going to play out for you the rest of the night? Right. You know, that's an interesting, very compelling, potentially dangerous. Like it's not, it's not a game for the, for the weak at, at heart at, at all. Like, yeah. So uh, I don't know. There's a lot of techniques. Dude, dude I could I, I, I could play that role. You could? You, you try to throw that at me. Sex like sex worker, bro? Yeah, easy. Easy. I, I could be at the party. I'm like, just, I'm on vacation. <laughs> 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 you know what I'm saying? Hey, listen, now, you know, don't come at me with that stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking a See, break. You, you would, know what I'm saying? You, like, would, this you is... would duck it by being on vacation, and I would leave rich. 
<laughs> See, but, right. <laughs> I'd be like, here are my rates. Yeah, uh, right. going to cost you. Put it on the and table. It's got to be real yeah. money. You know, yeah. that does sound fun. That's like better than the murder mystery nights because then you just don't know who's at the table, who's at the party. It gets dangerous. It gets yeah. crazy. Yeah, there could be a movie written around that, right? Like, yeah, where one person isn't who they say they are, even though while they're pretending to not be somebody else anyway. Yeah, like some. It's almost like. um Wedding Crashers, but for horror. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, that yeah. would be kind of hey, a cool movie, a, right? Like, that'd be interesting. Oh, there's a show right now that I want to watch. I think it's called, actually called Jury Duty, mm-hmm. where it's like... I've, I've heard of this. Seen I've that? heard Basically, of this, yes. Yeah, you heard right. of it. Yeah, Basically, like, it. there's... Oh, my God. You did watch it? it. Was, it, was it good? So good. I mean, those actors... Okay, I'm on it. It's, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, I heard. At least James I heard. James yeah. kills it, too. Like, uh, that poor guy, I still think... I feel for that guy. I mean, I think he'd be like, <laughs> need years of therapy. I mean, seriously, just like, um, but yeah, the, that reminds me in, in college, one of the, speaking of people who got you into stuff, one of the best professors I had was this guy, David Lee, and he had us do this thing called yeah. pastiche. Do you know pastiches? No, Where no, you, that's so dr- if you look up pastiche, it's, it, you sent, essentially you have to take an artist or someone and you basically have to re- do their whole life. But he had you write it. You had you. You had to research the person, and then you had to basically completely embody that. So you're not taking a play or a script or something. Mm-hmm. You're actually bringing the whole life of the person, and that would be cool with those. And that that actually changed a lot of my approach because you had to find that. Like you say, it could get dangerous. I had to. Um, I did Jimmy Cagney, and I remember figuring out in his mm-hmm. life like a huge pivotal point of his life, and then I had to write what that experience was like for him, even though I had no clue. But right. with all that you bring. Like you can get to some serious stuff and um, it's a great approach to just acting in general. Cause usually we just take what's on the page, but to put a yeah. life behind it. There's a through line through that whole but, thing, Nick, which is that basically you have to go to these uncomfortable places to get to the real, to get it. Oh. It's just being in the dark, yeah. but in a different way. Mm-hmm. What, what Frank was saying. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Cause like one of the characters that I love, the Shakespearean character character is Othello. Mm-hmm. And man, I tell you, Lawrence Fishburne's Othello, that kind of epitomized some of that for me. I was like, man, he played this so well. And just the idea that someone would mess with your life in such a, just a horrific way, yeah. honestly, I just felt like I felt it in my stomach. I mean, there's a line in there, man, that you can think about. And I'm going to say it, but you think about it in so many ways and it translates. But before Othello does himself in, he says, and I took by the throat the circumcised dog <laughs> and smote him <laughs> thus. And man, well, like when he says it, I'm just, man, this is amazing, dude. <laughs> this is what happens when we have guests like you, bro. Like you get in, you get inspired, Seriously, you know, bro, but yeah. like when you hear that, when he says that, when he took by the throat, like he realizes what he has become through all of this. And you just think about that and you just kind of sit and it resonates and you feel that. And if you can feel that in a character, like you're just saying, then you can bring out the appropriate type of emotion based off of that experience. Yeah. And that's, that's awesome. It's one of the best characters, man. I watched David Oye. Uh, I'm going to say his name wrong, right? Hey, boy. Oh, yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. On Yewu. Yeah. Oh, yes. On Yeah. On Yewu. Yep. His whole speech. I don't know if <laughs> yeah. He has the best speech trying to pronounce his name, but um, I saw his Othello with David Craig, Daniel Craig. Sorry. And Daniel yeah, Craig. Yep. And yeah, it was unbelievable. Like look up. Okay. I got to watch that. Yeah, it was, it was incredible. But you're right. It's one of the best, man. And when it moves like that. Yeah, it, it, it's it's, yeah, I, it's just I want to take advantage, by the way, of, of just having someone who's on both sides of the of the sort of hiring spectrum. Right. Like, yeah, you could go get an acting job tomorrow, but you could also go and hire an actor as an EP and, and, and as a producer. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to get your perspective on as an actor, how you view self tape versus audition, this sort of new thing that's happening where basically almost everything is self tape. And then as a producer, when you're trying to cast, like, do you have a harder time, easier time? What is your feeling when you have to look at a self tape versus an in-person audition? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, well, uh, 
candidly, I'll say as a producer, I enjoy in person better because I just, mm-hmm. I, yeah. you know, I think the thing that gets counted out is that at the end of the day, people want to work with people that they feel comfortable with and are yeah. just good people. And, and, and you can, you can kind of suss through that stuff, you know, in person and not to say that there's bad, but you can, there's just, I've been in rooms where, you know, you're just like, Oh, you know, you just, you're doing everything wrong, right? Like from just the improper, you know, stuff that you're just like, okay, um, we are not going to be able to create a safe space together, right? In person, but on camera now with like on self tape, I mean, selfishly as an actor, I, I do love it because I control the environment. I control the time, what I put in. I know a lot about camera setup, different things that can help that, you know? So, and then I've just learned by being on both sides that you usually do know within 30 seconds and it's not for anything other than just if the person's right or wrong, if you're hitting it tone, like things, you just kind of, it's, um, it's one of those pieces, but I think now that we're on the other side of the strike, if you, you've seen it now and, um, they are now creating space where you can request, you know, an appointment. Okay. So it's a zoom, you have that chance to be in the, in the room. And, and, uh, that to me was even before this, there was, when you started to get into, you know, some of these episodics and stuff, which really showed me how much we were going to decentralize our industry in a way, because, I was getting producer calls as an actor and there's an appointment and it was through an eco cast and I'm in the room with all the producers, the directors, and it's, you know, it's essentially just like this podcast. We're all in the same room together. It's just virtually. So I think now that that's accepted, you get a little bit of best of both worlds. And I think we'll see more of that in the, the next few years of grow. Yeah. I hope so. Did when you were acting, did you ever request your tapes and did producers send you tapes when you requested it? When did I request to be an appointment versus self tape? No, no, no. Did you like request your audition tape? You know, back when you, you know, like when you act in person, you know, some of these producers are going to ask you to do some pretty outrageous stuff in the audition, depending on what your character is. You might not want them to own that. Mm, And then it leaks somewhere later. Right. And be used to sort of stand on you in contract negotiation or just some of these nightmare stories I've heard. Yeah. Did you ever request your, t- your tape from a producer? Was that, or was that I, difficult? No, you know, I, I haven't, I guess I haven't had a, 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 a tape or an experience where I thought, mm, I don't want that out. You don't want them to have, right? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's, I mean, this is, I mean, honestly, that's, you know, get my take on like the strike and stuff. I mean, one thing I, I do kind of wish, even though I know it would be a double-edged sword is I just wish you had, as a producer, we had to pay for auditions. And, mm. and I mean, as an actor, I want to be like, if, even if it's 25, 20 yeah. bucks, 50 bucks, because the amount of work we're in such a, you know, microwave culture that it's, it's just like, if you're in music, it's like, you can't just put a demo. You can't put something kind of just, oh yeah, now I know the difference. Even with films, they say, oh, you can submit to that film festival. They'll know what it's like with, without the real sound or color. Mm-hmm. You don't do it. it yeah. Everyone is in finished product mode. So your self tape for all intents and purposes, I'll talk to actors. It's like, you're kind of putting up the work that is 80% there, or you're giving no work to it. Like you're just kind of putting something up and you're the right type. I have friends that do either. Like they don't do any work on it. It's basically almost teleprompter. Right. And then there's the other version where you're putting about, you're putting probably 80% of the work into the, the actual audition. So like when you show up, it's basically the work's already done. If you get the job. Got it. Yeah, I actually don't dislike the idea because it, one of me and Nick's big tenets as EPs is skin in the game. Like mm-hmm. we just believe that. I believe that in in business in general that all you have to do is figure out. You can almost see where where the fraud is going to come from, and it's going to come from the person who has the least skin in the game. Yeah, the person who won't attach themselves and risk everything to get the outcome. Like you want people and the other way Nick would say it probably not to speak for you while you're on this podcast, but it's like, he would say no mercenaries <laughs> because yeah. um, we, when somebody's not a mercenary, they're, they're just as enthusiastic about the project as you they're in it with you. There's a, there's a commitment on both sides. Yeah. You know, a dangerous contract is one where there's not a consideration on both sides of the contract by both parties. Mm-hmm. And right. I think that when you don't pay an actor to come in, like, like, then there is 
then it's completely one side and then the power dynamic is completely flipped in one, in one direction, you yeah. know, um, it, whereas if you had to pay them now, it would be unacceptable for you to come unprepared as a producer to meet each one of these actors or to leave early or to, or to call the audition short or whatever, unless you literally just found the person that's going to play the part. Right. Um, so I, I love the, I actually yeah. haven't heard anybody mention that and I love it. I mean, yeah, the, this is the thing. It's like, it, it creates appreciation. I, I, I remember yeah. when doing theater, there was a producer early days in New York, they were doing off Broadway and they created the, the all tickets were free. And, it, mm. and they just thought, oh, they're going to put everyone in and they were going to do this thing because they were trying to get their show to Broadway. And it was it, it pushed back in the worst way because audience didn't really care for the show because they didn't pay mm. for it. <clears throat> it. It's just this little element of appreciation. You just pay 10 bucks, 20 bucks to to your point. The double edged sword is you're going to see less people. Right. But yeah. if you only you're not going to get these thousands of submissions, but you're going to be really strategic with that 100 that you bring in because you've budgeted that. And you're right. How much more are you going to, is, is the person that's sitting in front of you, are you going to take that time to appreciate yeah. just the work that they're putting in and the person's getting paid yeah. to do it. So they're going to put work into your work. And even as a writer or as a producer, I'm going to feel better because I know the pr- I'm paying the person to be there. And they're giving him an incentive. But, he, but here's the question that I have. Like there, we do have a lot of conversation about the, the self tape and other things. Like I kind of wonder because filmmaking is such a family affair yeah right like you said you want to work with people that you respect that you love that love you that are going to be down for you how much do you actually go outside of your circle to find actors for your work and here's one of the reasons why i asked the question one is because we're talking about self-tape and that environment but the other one is the little bit of pushback that i put on folks when they try to i had to say this as nicely as possible uh, but how they try to push diversity, equity, and inclusion on folks. And here's why I give, there's a, there's a negative connotation or can be is that because it's so familial, it's so such a thing about relationships. It's not that you're keeping people out. It's that you're comfortable with the people that you've worked with. And depending where you're from, those people might have a certain accent they might have a certain hair color, right? They might look a certain way. So for you, like how often do you actually go outside of your circle when you're looking for people for your project versus staying within because you know what you know? It's a great, it's a great question. Um, I mean, and like, you know, getting into plugging your, your films, but the last film we did was American Reject and we, we qualified for di- the diversity contract and that stuff, but not even out of, we didn't go for it. It was, um, it, it's it's what we organically already were, but I think the thing is right. is that you we did like the major roles that we were in for were friends. Like to your point, they're just and yep. and honestly, full armor for me when we did when we is is to create a covering of artists that we work with that we find along the way. Just like we find each other here, it's like oh, we're going to cr- create a dialogue and you grow in that relationship over time, and then you and then that's how work happens, and so. But inevitably, there's always roles. So for you take American Reject, for example, we searched far and wide for those for mm-hmm. roles in, in there. And I mean, we needed to find a Filipino 10-year-old that could sing like Whitney Houston. That's <laughs> wow. <laughs> <Yeah. Britain. Good laughs> like you can't find that. <laughs> right. But at the same time, yeah. we had roles in there that, you know, my wife wrote it, Kathleen, but she she they were based on people, but and some had friends, but then there was some that we've searched. I mean, and I, I even um, locally, we tried to find a lot and then we would go out and, and, and look. So I, I just always feel like really that's a, it's an answer of percentage, you know, and just how much are you comfortable? Because I think it, it's kind of like your own dinner table when you're a filmmaker, like you said, it's, it's family, but you know, it's like Thanksgiving, like we just talked about. There's always those few seats at the table that you got to invite that's just going to create, a, you know, because you want to change it up a little bit with your family, right? You don't want to, you know, that's, but you want to keep making films with your family. But I think I, I'm of the person who wants to create a couple open seats to create that kind of. Okay. Just so long as it isn't, as it isn't Christmas dinner, like on the bear. Yeah. <laughs> You don't want that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, I got anxiety watching that episode, man. I was like, that was, that was one of the best 
pieces of artwork I think I've ever seen on TV. Just that one episode. And it, Nick, have you seen the the series The Bear? I haven't watched the. I haven't watched it. Oh, boy. I've seen this. The, you know, you get it's okay. Stuff it's hard. It, there's so many things to watch now. It's okay. Right. You missed it, but, well, but that's I highly you get recommend that stuff it. on social. Yeah, yeah. yeah, highly recommend it. Have you seen it, Frank? Yeah. Have you seen the? So, bear? I was gonna, I was gonna say, I, I watched the pilot, and I have. I was like, I need to circle back to it and finish it because it was so good. But it was so real, like family wise. I was like, oh, I gotta be. I got to sit down for this. I need to be ready for this. <laughs> yeah, that would, that's a great advice for anybody who's going to like watch the bear. But I want to amend to what you were saying there, Frank, too, about just like and, and, and address also, Nick, your, your, your question, because I, I think about that, too. And it, it, they're almost like separate ideas. And it's really, really hard to bridge the, the idea of DEI and quality filmmaking. Because when you go to do a, a, a equity raise, those those people want to know that you have a team. They want to know that you're put together, that you can actually execute this, that you can actually make it happen. Well, you can't do that if you have a bunch of people you don't know on your team. And um, quality is deeply, deeply affected by changes, um, especially at heads of department. Right. Like you're not going to be able to avoid strangers, I shall say, or like just like you're not going to be able to avoid that on the crew and, and and the whole filmmaking team. And if you have different sort of teams and locations, you're going to have somebody there that's that's a mercenary. But as long as you have the same heads of department, then you can c- quality control. You can keep the same style, look and tone that like you're known for or like, or like that you're trying to sort of like, there's a reason why all of Tarantino's films look like Tarantino, why Aronofsky's film look like Aronofsky guy, Ritchie, like, like it goes on and on, right? Wes Anderson's the most obvious one. It one or two people in the wrong heads of department will change that, that look, even your second AD, if they're not good with you, will change the outcome of your movie. So it, you're right, Nick. It's it's a conundrum because that is nepotism, I guess. But it's also no, necessary no, nepotism. Like if you don't have that, well, that your just... movie will will get. <laughs> no, man. You're just you're. It's called risk mitigation. Yeah, that's what it comes go. down to, right? Go, and buddy. like you said, there's like it's okay to build a team, and we should build teams. That's a, that's a thing. But I, that's but I get back to what Frank said because I was actually going to ask the same thing. It's like maybe there's actually a percentage. Mm-hmm. That's what it comes down to, and it gets it's kind of plays into both of what you know what you're both saying. Basically, it's like it's a percentage because I'm going to tell you, 75 percent of it is core. Right, we're running with these 75 percent people all the time. The 25 percent might be a mercenary who's bringing us food, might be an actor or someone else who's got a, this other kind of part, and that's okay because those are the open seats at the dinner table. Yeah. But I know 100% that my family is there because if that person who sits in that open seat acts a fool, <laughs> I got my people. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, right, you're right. not going to take us down. That's a great point. Because we're the 75%. So I, I think, yeah, both points are definitely valid. And I like what it. It also goes to like what, I mean, just to keep the analogy of the table going, but, you know, Thanksgiving dinner looks a lot different than Christmas dinner, right? I mean, yeah. you might be making a film that's, that's one way artistically and it, it, it allows for that, you know, the core and, and some more freedom and you're going to have some fun on this one. And you might have one that's like, look, this is, we need as little of people as possible, you know? And I, yep. you know, there's just the, the, it's the styles like Christmas dinner is just going to look different, right? It just might be less going on and you just want that kind of camaraderie, of family. So, you know, it's, I think that kind of goes into it too. It's like more of like, what is the film? Because I, I I do think that's a, that's a really real conversation that I've had with like really successful filmmakers. Like they just want to make film with the same people, you know, and you see it like at the top levels, they, they just want to do it. It's, you know, cause it's fun. (laughs) It's your friends. Why not? Like there's nothing bad about it. And that's my point is that there's nothing exclusionary exclusive about it there's that's not the intention the intention is to what is it when when we started doing the make it podcast that question we asked about what does it mean to make it Mm -hmm. it's basically what making a living 
doing what I love. No. And what more is that than doing what you love with the people that you love, right? That's it. So all the other stuff can feel contrived. It can feel a little bit more forced. It's like, what do you mean now I have to go outside of my family and bring other people in because my family just happens to all look very similar. Mm -hmm. And I can see how that can be a challenge with folks. And for you, like you said, it's been, it hasn't been homogenous just by nature. Mm -hmm. So you don't even have to think about it and it works out. But yeah, I was just, I was just curious if you were ever faced with that, but it looks like you have a couple open seats at the table and your family looks, you know, a little bit like this and a little bit like that. So it works. It's a good question for the times, man, because 10 years ago, what was everybody talking about? The Bechtel test. Oh, this, they didn't pass the Bechtel test. Now, like what's going on? Then it moved to trans and black and color in film. And now it's DEI. So it just keeps morphing into this thing that us as producers kind of have to chase and, and get right, but not to the degree that, you know, it really um, destroys your film or maybe even a genre of films. Like, you know, someone asked me the other day, like, hey, it's been a long time since we've seen a dog movie because I think there's a dog movie <laughs> yeah. coming. And I'm like, yeah, it's because the last dog movie got tanked right? because <laughs> at the day of release, somebody came out and said they abused the dog I and the movie that. tanked and everybody lost all their money. <laughs> and that only has to happen one time. And everybody runs for hills. We're not doing any more dog movies. It's too risky. At least not for the next five years. Well, well it's and been a you- long time, man. <laughs> they, they just did one. <laughs> And what I don't know, and, and about, I, man, Hallmark does dog movies every other day. You're talking about, I'm they, talking they about, the- I'm talking about <laughs> feature releases and theatrical, I know what bro. You're talking about. I think this dog I movie's coming out too, about. sadly to say, I think this dog's mostly CGI, so it can't be abused. Wow. You're talking about the comedy, like the Kevin Hart dog movie. Did that no, come out Yeah, already? that came out already. This is another one that kind of looks like a scrappy yeah. type Benji dog, like a slightly yeah. bigger Benji. Um, God, I just mm. age myself, but, but uh, kids <laughs> under, under 30 kids, people under 30, just go Google Benji, ben- <laughs> Google Benji, right. it's the OG, Beethoven. it's not the OG, I guess old yeah. yeller is the OG, old, well, old yeller. And then, uh, come on. There's uh, one wasn't, there, wasn't there like a Beethoven with like a really big, or what was it? Oh, there's Beethoven, Beethoven was, there's, yeah. there's old come yeller on, you know and there's, um, there's what one more, the, one of the dogs was a cowboy. Come on, man. It was Old Yeller the Cowboy? The uh, Lassie. Lassie. There you go. Yeah. Lassie. <laughs> that's, Lassie. that's the OG. Lassie make you cry, yeah. boy. Like, yeah. come on now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lass- Lassie's. <laughs> Little Timmy. Lassie's. <laughs> Little Timmy fell down the well. Uh, <laughs> La- Lassie's no joke. But that's the whole thing is like, if you try too hard to make everybody happy, you end up failing everybody. And, you know, that dog movies may be a bad example, but it's one example of trying to do everything just so, and then you still couldn't, you know, you, someone still sort of turned their back on you that, that didn't get what they wanted, what you uh, were supposed to do for this group, whether it be PETA or, or, or some other group. And now, now they're in essentially blackmailing you. Right. And then you call their bluff and then they tank your movie and then that's it. And so it, it's yeah, a, it's a, it's an interesting crazy. world. There is a little creep happening. By the way, I I was, I think we might talk about this in the newsletter, Nick. There's a little creep happening. I don't know if you're noticing this, Frank. There are Mm. two things that are like right in front of us, right? Like AI uh, contracts with the actors with SAG and and the the WGA, which we can speak on a bit. Because we do want to talk about average Joes as much as you're allowed to and how you get this, how things have changed since the strike is over, since you got a SAG after exception on that Mm -hmm. and and what the process was like. But there's this little creep and it's hiding and it's just coming up slowly. I, I wonder if you both have noticed it. There is this Wait a second. void. Yep. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> there's a few, actually, there's a few really <laughs> scary faces over your shoulder. Exactly. Actually. Like, <laughs> like on both shoulders, there's like not a pleasant face yeah, on either side was, of you. I, I was a little nervous, bro. Yeah. Yeah, like, he keeps talking about his For little those creep. not watching on YouTube, Nick has a wall full of Lego. Uh, uh, what would you call them? Lego, Lego art, art, Lego, Lego, Lego mosaics. mosaics. That's just, you know, for. Frank, yeah, these these are all no set. Come bro. on, this is just all stuff that I create with the kids. I love and, that. And hug it up. That's yeah, these good. are. So Nick has a wall of at least thirty Lego mosaics, and oh. over both of his shoulders are two very very creepy ones. One is I think the Joker, <laughs> and oh. and the there other one is who Nick. Jack Skellington. Oh, Jack Skellington. Man. So yeah, and then he's got Luigi and Princess. Oh, you know that Zelda? Right 
Yeah. Oh, oh that's Black yeah. Panther. Yo, he saw yeah, Zelda. Saw that, yeah. too, but you know that one right there. That, yeah. yeah. Thundercats. Yeah, he's, bro. he's, oh, Thundercats. That's right. Yeah. So it's, it's just yeah. an amazing mm-hmm. wall and I love looking at it. But the creep here is that there are, there is this giant void of male lead actors under 40. There aren't any. There's this link, and I think we'll end up putting it in the newsletter. No, there's one. And when you see this list, Nick, of names that of actors, you will be shocked that all these people are over 40. Oh, no, man. There's, there's one. And I, I see him in Timothy everything. Timothy Chalamet? Like, yeah, yeah I was gonna there say. it is. But Timothy Chalamet <laughs> can't do every movie, right? Like, he's got Wonka coming up. Who knows how that's going to be? Uh, yeah. It's but crazy. you got Timothy yeah. Chalamet. Here's, here's what I counted. So I was on the phone earlier with a director friend of mine, and uh, we were talking about this and we all we could come up with under 40 that really makes sense that are really stars, Frank, that have a name that you can count mm. on and bank on for box office. Right. Like if you, you're walking into the streamer or walking to the to AMC and you're trying to sell your movie at AFM even. Right. I've got Timothy Chalamet. I've got Channing Tatum. I've got uh, the dude that played Elvis, Austin Butler. And I've got John David Washington, like from Tenet and the creator, like Denzel's son. I think that's it. Like who else is under 40? What about, uh, what's it, what's the guy's name who played, uh, Elton John? He's, uh, uh, in uh, rocket man. Oh, okay. Uh, t- and, Tom, oh. there's Tom Holland. I should, I should mention Tom Holland. Okay. Spider Man. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know that. Yeah. I don't know that guy. Like he's, uh, uh, I know what you're talking about. He was leading Blackbird. Um, series. Um, but anyways, I would say he's, uh, but look, the fact he, that we can't think, think of him yeah, is the point. Yeah. Taron Edgerton. Well, that's what I'm saying. I was also going to say the lead Taron Edgerton, some of the leads in like, um, I'd also say that uh, us, well, I was going to say get out. Right. Because they really, yeah, bad. exactly. Uh, is he under exactly. 40? Exactly. Yeah, good question. And exactly. Is, is, uh, like there's like Keith Stanfield. Like, like I, I think, I was going to say yeah. Lakeith, but he's not, he doesn't hit the star. He, he should. Just, he's he's he, been he in there might, like, he's. What about Gary? I, mean, I think he should get he's super there, talented. Yeah. But he's not there yet. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so here are the names man. that are it's, over it's, 40. Just like, yeah. Like just off the top of my head, of course you have, there's nobody to replace Pacino, De Niro. Um, you know, who's replacing Will Smith over 50, Brad Pitt over 50. Leonardo DiCaprio yeah. was 49 years old. Like let yeah. that sink in. Yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal is forty two, Bradley Cooper forty three. But to go back to your your point about what the the seasons we're in, right? As filmmakers, yeah. I was having a conversation with another producer friend of mine about just, I mean, this is going to sound funny, but just masculinity in the leading man. And yeah. I don't think it's ever. I don't know. Honestly, I don't think that fifty year old stars that we're talking about and. You know, I hate to put everybody in that, but I don't think they match our De Niro generation. I don't think they match an Al Pacino and, you know, what these guys did to really bring this just like masculine, full, you know, just heart of a man into like some real vulnerable roles that we just haven't seen that. Um, You know, who would play Taxi Driver? Michael B. Jordan? Yeah. (laughs) Like, you know, like who would who would do it? You know, right. No, that's under brain. 40. Yeah, just... they, they, they're not using AI to replace actors. They're using AI to, to take the stars we know and make them look younger. It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. They did that with uh, Tom Cruise and MI, right? The latest MI? Yeah. Indiana, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. Like they can't let Harrison Ford die. There's no replacement for him. It also might even be a reaction to we don't have the A listers like we had, just with the saturation in mm-hmm. the golden age of stars, you know, I mean, a lot of these are are from the nineties and that was just a different time. And you, you could build an A-lister, you know, that we watched kind of a road, you know, in a way, like you, you just don't have that kind of superstar. Like, um, I remember when they were saying like Jim Carrey was kind of the last Mm. actor, right. To to have that like superstardom Mm. level. Yeah. Yeah, I got an idea, Frank, let's let's play with this real quick. And just, I could be totally wrong. I'm usually not. But, um, so, <laughs> so what I'm thinking is there was something that we had back in the day that we don't have now. Mm. At least it's, it is eroding as well. Lick a stick. We had commercials. Oh, stop that. Sorry. We had commercials. <laughs> 
And that's where people had to cut their teeth as actors was in commercial work. So if you look at all these actors you're talking about, uh, they started out doing commercials. And then they kept doing commercials. And they just kind of kept going through and then maturating throughout that process. We don't have that now. Like, there's commercials at the Super Bowl. But, like, we avoid commercials or our commercials are 15 seconds, right? Or 10 seconds or 6 seconds Oh, I now. see what you're getting at now. Because I'm like, a lot of actors do commercials. But but that's what I'm saying. But, we're but not we don't. Growing. You're saying we're not watching them, so we're not getting familiar with these people. And, and those people aren't. I just feel like they're not growing through the commercial process. You see what I'm saying? But because a lot of them started at the age of five and then they were seven and they were not even saying they, they grew up in the industry and they became names that you are familiar with. And then they get put into these Drew roles. Barrymore. And, exactly. So now how does that work? When do they first cut their teeth at acting? Where do you find them? Mm -hmm. How do you know that they're professionals? Because these kids were professionals by the age of 12. They started at five. I mean, seven years. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's a long time in the industry, mm -hmm. seven years, but you're only 12 years old. But you've been doing these things. And I'm just wondering if that's potentially part of why we don't have that a core anymore. Because you, you haven't built relationships over the course of 20 years. With, I mean, you think mean about, with the viewer. You mentioned, yeah, and, and with the industry. I mean, you mentioned DiCaprio. I mean, how young was he when he started was it was basketball diaries his first thing no he did something uh, really I, don't, I don't know i mean he did he did television you know he did was, uh, yeah, oh yeah he that, did. Uh, you're right show that he was on but he, he's got the famous uh audition tape with um de niro um gosh yeah no he he did yeah i mean but he's doing it from as i'm saying he did it from such a young age and I feel like that's why also there's such big stars is that they've been around for so long. Mm -hmm. They've done so many things. And like you said, from the viewer's perspective, we respect that journey. We've seen them in so many things. In some respects, many of us grew up with them. Yeah. And then you had the industry side of it, which is we grew, they grew up with them. They know them. They know their families, right? They've created relationships. They're built into the industry for a very long time, which is, again, I, don't, I just don't know. What does that look like now? It, we don't do commercials like that anymore. Yeah. But also, like, I, I just, wonder, just thought, I, I wonder, too, with just the amount of access that we have now to, to people and lives, like, you used to not have the access, you know? You didn't, you didn't know Harrison Ford, you know, in Indiana. Your only access was when you got to the theater to see them again. And you attach, mm -hmm. they became A-listers because you attach yourself to them. And you want to be in the movie theater with Julia Roberts. You want to be in there. And we always learn that as actors growing up. Like once you hit the A-level star status, you're not acting anymore. You're there to be you in that role. And, you know, so Beautifully put. this this is an element of like you now you have full access. You know, Chris Pratt's world and his where he lives and where he has a farm and how his kids are and that he's divorced. I mean, you know, everything. And I just think, you know, it's like you could go into modern sports a little bit, you know, the same way. Like, do we, we have full access into these worlds? And then they, it's not as we get, whether we get tired of it or we just are with them elsewhere, we don't need to go to the movie theater to be with them anymore. Is diluted. Yeah. Is diluted. I think social media also dilutes it for better or for worse. Sure. But it's, what are you if talking you, about if you, if you see someone on social media, well, just if you see people on social media that you follow that have 10 million followers, your whole experience with them is just via social. It's on your phone, mm -hmm. but you might like them more than you like someone on the big screen, yeah. right? They're more of a celebrity to you than someone else on the screen. But before, for us, we didn't have that. Yeah. That celebrity was only on the movies. Like you only got to see them there. Yeah. I was like, wow. Yeah. 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 The, the, the so age I'm, of I'm like putting you. posters on your wall doesn't, yes. it, it <laughs> seems reserved for athletes now because, you know, or if, if at all, you, you make the point, Nick, a couple of weeks ago about how, like, maybe a couple of months ago, actually, when Barbie was out, that you know, hey, this is just, it's great, but it's a, it's a, it's a long commercial for Mattel, and and I, I agree with that. Yep. And and I love the movie, on the record, saying that many times. But it is a big commercial, and I think maybe that's how it's being done now. Like you, you do it through Disney, and and Disney has these shows where. Uh, all the stars on those shows end up being your next movie stars or musicians of late. 
Um, and these Disney shows, you've, you've seen how they play out, how they're written. It's terrible. Uh, and <laughs> they are just commercials for Disney and commercials for those, for the, the scripts many times. I think, I think high school musical, for example, those scripts are written as a platform to show off that person's talents mm-hmm. because they have a long-term plan for them. I think Kurt Russell, by the way, fun fact was the very first sort of Disney actor that came out of the Disney television machine wow. and became a big star. And now Kurt's been in the business for 50 years. Like that's a sustainable model, man. Like Kurt knows where all the bodies are buried. Like, so, <laughs> like so that's, play. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, that's yeah. dope. Okay. So before it gets away from us, what was it like getting the exception during the strike yeah. and what happens now if the strike is over with that exception? For, for average Joes. Yeah. So that, that was a, um, a bit of a unicorn for us because um, we got a film for full armor. That is uh, just production services in new Orleans. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we were in charge of just fully uh, casting and doing tax credits and uh, getting that film off the ground in new Orleans. And so th- that was really, really interesting because um, you know, with SAG and being able to, obviously I'm part of SAG and we knew it was coming. We knew that the the project was funded and, and wanting to go, but um, it was really, I, I knew if we at least get into the application process and get it moving, that we should be good. And they wanted to go for the end of August was the start date. Um, ultimately it was, you know, it was crazy with everything going on, obviously with the strike, with the writer's strike and, the, and, and also the, obviously the acting then kind of coming in behind it we didn't really know where we were going to be as far as, is this going to be good? Should we keep moving forward? It wasn't a WGA project. So we knew we could, the strikes was looming for SAG, but um, we really wanted to be that kind of piece where we could at least give jobs. And then that ultimately hmm. we got pushed about a month just to work out the paperwork with the interim agreement. Cause it wasn't written. It was a work in progress. So we really became kind of one of the, the first round of Guinea pigs for SAG because they were, expedited everyone who was in production who had to halt because obviously they were burning money as it was going. So they expedited everything that was currently in production that could be proceeded with an interim agreement. And then we became the first kind of, all right, how do we do this? And it was a work in progress because you had agents and managers saying, don't talk to anyone without an interim agreement. We were kind of loosely approved by everything showing finances and who we, you know, who the team was and where we were going. And then yet you had to write the agreement. It wasn't written. So ultimately it, mm. it was about three, four weeks. We ended up kind of just kind of going through that process with SAG. And then we ended up um, being able to go for the end of September. We started and we were able to do production. So we were the only movie in production. It was about a 75 person crew. Uh, honestly, it was, a, uh, it was a really kind of bittersweet project because I, you know, being able to give that kind of jobs in that time for everyone. Um, it was a, it was really great because we were the only movie going in New Orleans. In Louisiana. Yeah, well, three to four weeks is not a long time. I mean, considering all that was going on, yeah, that's not terrible. No, and the fact you know, that we could, a, <laughs> yeah, go. And- exactly. And and th- so the, I guess the question that the other side of Qu- Chris's question and that we were talking about earlier is like, okay, so you got the exception. Did the exception come with any constraints or rules that now are hindering you in this stage of the game? Like, is there yeah. certain things you couldn't do or whatever? Do you now that the stri- strike is over, does that hurt you at all? I don't believe so. I mean, I, you know, we were, I mean, yeah. looking at the interim agreement, there was nothing, you know, we just basically had to agree to everything that, you know, obviously SAG was negotiating with the studios and it was really easy to say yes to. I think that, you know, you had to kind of figure out what was that, um, you know, the residual thing going to be and, and all of that. Yeah. They had to, we had to basically, you know, just agree to all the terms, but by no. And now that they're have moved into post and uh, it doesn't seem like it'll, you know, hang up on anything. Um, and we had already, I mean, what some people don't know too, the rates had already kind of gone up right at the beginning of July, the rates were due to go up. And so we had already, it's that we had already kind of advised to go up on the budget, make sure everything was, you know, where they needed to be going into that. Okay. So then really the rates were, you could say could have been, but it was all budgeted for. And, but you didn't have the option to lock in the lower rate. No, because or the, it was already or the grandfathered rate. Right. Yeah. It was already put, uh, put forward. I think the, uh, and we were DGA as well. And that had gone up okay. at the beginning of July. 
So yeah. that was kind of all grandfathered in. Yep. 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 <laughs> that's nice. very, that's, yep. Uh, well, one thing that's fascinating that just jumped out to me is one film in Louisiana. Cause you know, I don't think Louisiana gets the credit they deserve for their filmmaking community outside of Louisiana. Now inside Louisiana, they definitely do. I mean, for those listening and watching, Louisiana was the first state to have a taxpayer incentive. Everyone else copied. And I think we talked about earlier, Nick, like up to 45 states did it. I think it's been sort of truncated back down to 35 states. Yeah. But I know, I, you know, I'm in the state of Tennessee and we we just copy and pasted Louisiana's uh, program, according to our executive director, Everybody Bob Rains. Did. Shout out to Bob Rains. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, everybody just copy and paste at Louisiana. So I, that film community, I feel like, has a head start on every other state that's not in California. That's not California or New York. Yeah, we just we actually cut the trailer for the film office. Um, I know we'll have like the fun fact period, but do you know the year that they the first tax incentive was? Uh, mm-hmm. See, you've been messing around with Nin- this. Nineteen ninety two. That's right. Nineteen ninety two. Thirty years. Yep. <laughs> we did the trailer uh, for the film office yep. because honestly, they just New Orleans is is we kind of always joke inside of New Orleans. They they just know that they have something good, so they don't promote any of it. Right down to music, oh, okay, that's what jazz. It is. They had okay. you know like they just know it it's there. And uh, film was that you know it was it was designed to help the local independent filmmakers when it was put in. And then obviously you had your John Grisham movies and those mm-hmm. early nineties. And, you know, we have the team that I work with, the line producer, Tracy Keller is in our, on our team. She worked in runaway jury. You know, the fun mm-hmm. thing was like a lot of these guys oh, came nice. up through, um, you know, the, there in new Orleans in the nineties. And we were actually able to put on this last movie. We got to put a whole crew, talk about family and table that had actually gotten their start together from locations department and they had, they've all kind of gone off to have their careers and work on 12 years of slave and all the, you know, uh, big titles there in new Orleans, but um, they hadn't worked together. So it was cool with the strike. What it did provide is a lot of guys that hadn't worked together in 20 plus years, got to work together on this film. That's so cool. So that was, yeah, that was, that was really cool, but it, it's true. I don't think it gets enough love. I mean, I know all the numbers cause we're constantly just trying to, let everyone know in state how big of an industry we actually have there. I think it's still third in the States as far as how big, I think it moved to number one in 2013 before they kind of had their hiccup. And what is, what is the percentage now? What, what's the rebate? What's the okay, grand so rebate? Crazy, on? crazy thing is well, it's 40%. I still Holy think it's the moly. best in all the States. Can, yeah, right. Come on. <laughs> we, we shot in Chalmette, which is just down the road from New Orleans. That actually has an extra percentage. We got this production up to 43.5. It gives you an extra three and a half. How do you get that? You have to shoot in Chalmette. So that parish, which is yeah. like they, they do parishes mm-hmm. there in Louisiana versus counties. So that parish, which is like a county, if you shoot there, that actual parish will give you an extra three and a half for all the spin that happens within its businesses and, you know, real hard spins and in that county. So do they keep money in the pot though, Frank? Like, like mm-hmm. it, or yeah, is you, it one of the situations where you get there and, and then it's depleted and there's depleted. No, they, they actually have it. I mean, I think, um, they just, they just extended it. So we're extended okay. to 2030. It's 40%. Wow. There's different buckets. So there is a cap in the state. So it's 180 million. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. they do kind of go into the next year. So you're, you're not left out. You're just kind of have to wait. If you, if that bucket that you're in, for independent filmmakers, you know, we're, we're as full armor, we're constantly promoting that. It's like, come, come there to make it because there's an independent film bucket, right? So it's kind of like I'm promoting against myself because there's a whole that 10% of that is all set aside for independent filmmakers. And then you have a whole on top of it. If you are obviously a Louisiana resident and you're a Louisiana screenplay, there's a whole nother 10% that you get. What's the minimum spend? Is it 250? So if you're in state Louisiana, there's actually no minimum. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's like, dude. are you serious? Dude. Wait, no, so, <laughs> right. So you, <laughs> you get a percentage back depending on what bucket you're in, regardless of what the mm-hmm. budget of the film is. Yeah. Yeah. If you like, let's say you did a, um, now I will say, you know, there's some fees. I think it's like 7,000 to apply, you know, to the applications. Okay. You might want to okay. be at like, that's 20, interesting. 
20 K, you know, 50 K. Uh, I haven't done it that low, but you can, uh, we've, we've talked to different people with like, they might have a music video or different things. They could qualify. Um, but I've had friends that have come down that have done, you know, hundred, 200 K films. But so if, on the bigger, if you're outside out of state coming in, the minimum is 300,000. So okay. you're coming okay. in. That's your, that's kind of your, if you're in the main bucket of the cap, you're that's good to know. And, and is, is Louisiana still a Republican state? Yeah. Like, is it got a Republican governor? Yeah. And see, th- so this is always like, kind of like not, it's never said out loud. It's never said, you know, directly. So I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth or, or, you know, it's, but it is intimated. And I think I'm being fair by saying that it is intimated that, you know, the reason why, you know, can, you know, Tennessee, for example, or some of these other Southern states won't change a rebate is because, you know, maybe you're filming blue city, red state. Mm -hmm. And I think Louisiana has just proved proven that that doesn't have to be an obstacle. Well, because it's industry, it's working. It's working. Right? And look, there's, <laughs> I know the numbers because we just went and petitioned in Baton Rouge for this, right? So as our crew of like local filmmakers, it was, we all rallied and we have some really cool people leading the charge that are actually independent studio owners. And I've been really kind of championing that because I think we look at studio owners and we think the studios, we think LA, you think big, you know, big money, that's all this yep. stuff but there actually are independent owners who actually run studios. And to me, that's where, that's the reason why we moved our company from New York there. It won because it was open. There was the hospitality. I'm from there obviously. And I had my eyes set on it and um, I was already seeing what was happening. But the minute I got down there and started seeing like, Oh no, this is completely open um, to, I could walk to up to a studio owner and be like, could we work on your down months? Can we, can we negotiate what's going on? And we did that with American reject. And it, it, to me, it created something that's impossible as filmmakers. We don't think we have the ability to go into a studio or even that kind of controlled environment and help our film. And New Orleans makes that possible because, but I do think I'm not, it's not all utopious. I will say Baton Rouge, it is a, it is a blue city in a, in a red state. I mean, and right. there is a conversation of like, let's get rid of the film tax credit. And that is a topic that has to come cycle through the, the politics. And, but these studio owners that are independently owned and all of the union, I mean, I think we have about 400, just under 400 million on payroll. Um, mm-hmm. It's, it's, they, they say it's about 20 crews deep in, in the state. That's an industry, you know, I it did close yeah, to a billion exactly. in 21 Wait, no, 22, right? This year's down. So in 22, it was close, just under a billion in production. So, I mean, that's wow. you, what you have to look at. And most people don't look at it. They're looking at the 180 million incentive, but you have to look at the 900 million that's coming in. <laughs> right. Like, don't look at the budget <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's coming in. Don't look at the, you know, the tax rate. And so there's a lot of politics that's in that, you know, and I think it's a, it's a constant fight. And I, but I knew this from New York, you know, it was Manhattan versus, you know, Albany, you know what I mean? It's just this like element of like, what's, why are you making all the money? Why is everything going on down there? It's kind of the same thing. You got, it's like someone up in Shreveport. It's like, how does this help me? You know, but we, this last project we were on, we just, there was, it's, it had football involved. We involved a bunch of schools. I was like making sure every council person knew that there was money going into the schools and these other counties that wouldn't have, you know, parishes, but that wouldn't have been there before. So, you know, you just, you got to make people aware of how much we talked about it with the strike. You don't realize all the ancillary businesses that happen in and around this industry. And there's just so That's right. much uh, more than what people know, just looking at the screen. Chris, man, we need to be down in New Orleans, well, man. Let's go. Exactly. We need to trail. Well, that, it, believe it or not, know, I've like, been all around the world, but, I, <laughs> but New Orleans is the one city I haven't been to. I like, I know that uh, people might, I, I shudder at it. Like, I'm like, oh, I can't, I've been all these places and I just, ha- and I'm a foodie on top of that. And I haven't been down that. to New Orleans. So, so <laughs> yeah, now that man, it frames yeah, down man, there, we, gotta, we, gotta we, can, we can handle up, go down there. Maybe we can find a panel yeah. to hop on, on a film festival down there or something where yeah, we can contribute something yeah, yeah. beneficial to the indie film community. I don't want to just go down there for me. I want to do something for the filmmakers. Bro, but we're, we're, we're talking right now to the man who has the golden key. To the city. <laughs> That's right. So, this is true. You know, I, I, I don't, uh, yeah, well, I think we'll be, but, okay, but you know, Hey, I got a, I got a question. Yeah. Is two jogs still down there? Two jogs. I don't yes. think it is. That's a good question. 
I actually don't know if it is. We actually just there was an I gotta look there was an up. article that just came out of like so all the great um, spots that we've actually lost because and you speak of Foodie Town. I kind of joke it's not obviously New York, but there are so many new restaurants and there's so many like mm-hmm. new places to eat that it's it's kind of insane how much of a foodie town uh, New Orleans is. Mm. So that's speaking my language. It, you got to come down. Yeah, it's, it used to be before Katrina. It was all like, let's let me get the classic New Orleans cuisine. Now it's like hitting up places that have just some of the best different you know foods that y- you're just celebrity chefs and you know so. Yeah, but you know how do the New Orleans feel about that, man? You know those folks. You got to get a po' boy. Yeah. You know it's like you want a po' boy the way a po' boy is supposed to be. You don't necessarily want a po' boy on a plate this big, right? 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 right, right. <laughs> you know, with two pieces of shrimp in it. You want a po' yeah. boy. So no, it's it's funny. Nah, it's different. As like as being those places being uh, local, it's funny. It's like you want to go to all the new, like the hidden burger spot, the different things, because you're mm. you already have your spots. Like we get, you know, we get our po' okay. boys yeah. and our crawfish, like. Sundays, Saints games, like that's our barbecue. Like that's our outback, you know, yep. we have all that covered. Like we don't care. Go try to make your, Got you know, it. jambalaya with pasta. Go do all that. That's fine. That's, that's not going to live here long. You know, like <laughs> right. Right. I, you I, go I make a meme, you know, pizza. there's some Italian spots that came up like different, like, you know, that's my favorite food, by the way, Italian oh. food. It is, yeah. it's, it's just like the overall best, right? Like, like the variety of things you can get in the general flavor. I mean, like you, you really can't go, can't go wrong with with Italian. That's just, I know some people might say like Japanese food. I mean, it's up there for me too, but like Italian, you can't go wrong, especially if you want to leave full mm. and you want to feel like you did oh, something well, naughty. Uh, and, and, and here, <laughs> right. here to, to just bringing up like what film productions bring into a state, you know, the, we have the same situation where these things come up and it's like, why don't we just get rid of it all together? Let's be a, like a fiscally responsible state balanced budget state. And then, you know, our executive director in Tennessee, Bob Rands, will say Nashville brought in $700 million. Like the show Nashville. Oh, wow. 700, really? Yeah, $700 million. Like, yeah, so sure. let's not get rid of this. And actually, let's support more shows like Bluff City out of Memphis and Lynn Stadler's down there. Um, and so the, I think that's, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. But those those revenues, that's really what our leaders lean on to, to keep these, these rebates sort of in place. I I think it's interesting too, what you talked about, about like studio independent studios. I think we have to do it. I actually think we're being forced into, I was on the phone with a producer earlier uh, this week. He he produced the movie Ad Astra. It was one of his movies and has another one. Um, the water diviner. Anyway, he's done some movies and he was saying that like what's happening underneath our noses is that the streamers are going out and booking studios in the UK and all around where the best rebates are and booking them out for years so that if you don't contract with them, you can't use their studio. And yeah. you can't get any of the resource. You actually can't get on a sound stage, and yeah. so you have to go out. Because I said, "Well, what's the weirdest resource thing or thing you've resourced?" He's like, "I have like a spreadsheet that has every uh, abandoned warehouse in the country on it." Wow! <laughs> like yeah. that's dope to me. Like this is yeah. where the mindset is yeah, for the independent cool. producer right now. It's like, yeah. let me go find out where all because commercial real estate's down thirty percent. Yeah. Let me go find like where all the empty abandoned warehouses are in the country. And let's just see if we can get one and make a studio or a soundstage out of it. Right. Because then you own the vertical. Mm-hmm. Right. You do. And, and if you don't do that, you're literally going to be fighting Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Warner universe. Like you're going to be fighting all of them, not just for talent anymore, where they'll contract the talent out and that talent's locked up with that studio but now you're going to actually have to compete with them for sound stages. Right. Yeah. The it's good crazy. thing of mine in where we shot, we shot at the ranch. Um, we weren't on the stage proper, but we were in their production offices for this, you know, um, this budget film. And it was a, uh, it was decent indie film, but it was, uh, the guy who started the ranch, a good friend of mine. He, he basically, he was a locations manager who did Terminator there, got the lows for the production and then kept, the contract after it was like, 
it was empty. It was a flagship spot converted yep. into a studio yep. and uh, then bought the grocery store next to it with his, his partners. And he has, they have over close to 500,000 square feet of, of space that they're now the uh, main tenant for AMC. They've shot, uh, you know, Amazing. interview and vampire, you know, Bill and Ted, they've, they've, they've done close to, uh, they've done over a billion in just eight years of just production. And it's that empty warehouse. Like this is, to me, the thing is, is, you know, when I was traveling around LA and when you're sitting there looking at, you look at all the major studios, you just dream to jump the fence and go make your film. Right. Yeah. You see all of the sets, the things you, you cause that's what we do at heart. You kind of look at what locations do you have? I have a cabin. I have a thing, you know, you're always looking at that area, but now when you start to make film, you start realizing I need the octopus. I need like the one made spot and I need to like, just be in this area, everything around and you it. want that kind of yeah. uncontrolled, controlled environment. And, um, I think that independent version of that is exactly where we're going. And I think, I think we're going to head into a really, really great time for independent film with everything. Cause I think the dirty secret with coming out of the strike is that the pocketbooks are all tight. They're going to be mm -hmm. tighter. You're not going to make as much like there's an agreement, like whether we'd like to admit it or not, that I think the money that's being lost is real. I think, I think the money that's being made is real and I think it just won't be spent as much. And I think there has been a, like, there is a fatigue, right. In the content area. Like, I think you can kind of see that fatigue with the amount of outlets and stuff. So you're going to see, a, I think, because I, when I, we were, we were always developing, but we knew, we knew the money stopped a year before the strikes. So we knew like things were, they were mm -hmm. stopping, like there wasn't mm -hmm. new shows being made. And I think. I don't think you're going to see as much come back is really what's going to happen. But what is that going to do? It's going to create this huge, the, I mean, I'm already hearing and talking to certain like executives that are, they're looking to get out of the studio to go make, cause there's still filmmakers that are, you know, there on salary within the studio too. And I don't think that heart changes. So. So what happens, what happens if I'm a, an independent filmmaker, can you just tell me how do I approach? Cause I, I think, I don't know if I would give this advice, Chris, you can jump in on this too, but independent filmmakers, I feel like they should be going to studios to try to make a better version of the project that they want to make, as opposed to just trying to make it on their own. But I think they do have that mindset, like Chris mentioned earlier, that all the studios are Disney. All the studios are things that you can't mm -hmm. touch, but they don't think about the independent studios. So if you could speak to independent filmmakers who want to make a low budget film, but they want to do it right. What's the best way to approach an independent studio to make their film? I, I think, I think obviously it's, it's what you guys say a lot, which is like, you know, it's kind of starting where you are, right? Like what is, are you in a city and what is that community? Because I think that, you know, that's what we, we sought out. Cause I think, did I hear you right? Were you saying as an independent, you would, you would advise going to the majors, like pitching and no, I would I would advise going to an independent sure. studio right. as opposed to just doing it on their own, like getting the crew together, making it happen, because the difference between you doing it in the yard, doing it at your friend's house, doing it, the studio. That's what mm -hmm. they do day in and day out. They understand the business of this. They understand the locations of this. They understand all of this. You just need to take your independent thought, your creativity and then funnel it through a channel that does this on a regular yeah. basis. But I just, like I said, I don't think they think about that. I think they're like, Oh, I can't get right. a studio. They're too big. No one's going to take me. I'm like, that's not yeah, true. It's, though. Not, it, it's <laughs> so, not true. You're right. I, I think you, you, well, you have a, you have an idea of your budget or what you can do. And I, I think it's always good to start there. Right. So it's like, how much do I have? And you're still a project. Like, so mm -hmm. these are still businesses. Like they still have bottom lines and they make their money uh, in different ways. And so, you know, it's, it's like a movie theater. There is empty real estate in a movie theater between Monday and Thursday. They're still trying to figure out how to put people yep. through. And the only way they make money is through concessions. So it helps them to have people right. Like through Monday to Thursday, if you can answer a problem. So if you're, a, if you're a movie and you have a budget of 300,000, you know, and, and it would help you to have some form of studio environment meaning some kind of controlled, whether it's office space or something like for us with American reject, we needed to create a reality show. We, we were, we were a, a comedy based on a reality singing competition. We were told we pitched to all the majors. We were told we couldn't make it for by X, you know? And so that 
was not possible. Mm-hmm. So we still, we knew we needed a stage. So that's what got us knocking at a door. I think if like, if you're in Nashville, like there are mm-hmm. stages, there are studios and they, I guarantee you, they have empty spaces and they have empty times. Their calendar is not 100% full. So if, if their occupancy is at 80%, go be the 20%, go find time that they need it. And, and just, that's what we did. We were like, when do you, when are you empty? And what would you give it to us for? And what's your bottom line, you know, and can we, and and you just, because you're still business to them because you still have a budget. And then you just Mm -hmm. see on your loose leaf paper, does it, can it fit, you know, can a dollar a square foot (laughs) that they're going to give me fit in the budget or does that warehouse down the street where the guy who doesn't know film at all, is that better, you know, and then you can decide and you're in charge. Like at the end of the day, that's that, that, what is your film need? That's the whole thing right there. Because the, the, the challenge Nick really is what, what is your story mm-hmm. and what is your budget? Cause if your story requires someone to build a set or it needs a giant led screen or something like that now, now yeah, you got the studio and it's an independent studio, but I don't need it. My story happens, you know, on a mountain range or I need it, but I can't afford it. Um, it's not as if you can just sort of go in there and, and just shoot exactly what you want. So I think the advice is sound, but, but your script and your budget have to align with that business. That is that, that, that independent studio. Mm -hmm. In terms of four walling, I think it's an interesting concept as well. Like just like, Hey, AMC, you're, you're empty Monday through Thursday. It's funny you bring it up. We talk about this a lot. Like people don't understand necessarily that a theater is a real estate business. It is a, it is a density, uh, business actually, uh, more than it is a movie business. But some of these art houses. Now this is interesting because this is like inside baseball stuff that will, will, will keep you from doing what you want to do. I heard from an art house director, no names, that they had to stop letting filmmakers for a wall, even if they paid for the seats and then had to sell against it like a promoter Mm -hmm. because the uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences would take their license away and stop distributing studio films to their that they were that filled their seats during the week. Right. Like these, like, cause they were creating competition. Right. So, so this idea of like, so this art house <laughs> theater shows all the sort of movies that your Regal and AMC won't run on a big screen. Right. They're showing like the art house movies, the, the Academy award movies, and they won't get those anymore, which is their bread and butter. If they show your indie film and they well, get caught doing it. And I'm like, wow. Okay. So again, systematic wall that you have to jump as a creator and you have to be able to, as a producer, you have to create a deal with a distributor that allows your film to not be seen as the kind of film that the Academy of Arts and Sciences would shun. I would say you, they, but this would be, and I'm not saying this is going to be foolproof, but every theater, that art house owner has a booking agent and they book through somebody. And I would ask them if I was going to it, who books you? Mm-hmm. And can I just have that contact? Because you've got to go through the way what th- that ultimately says is the channel. So I know the Britannia theater locally. I know the guys who run it. I know mm-hmm. a really great Ben Zeitlin, beast of Southern wild. He started a group that they, they have a love chain letter of filmmaking. You can watch every Thursday night locally that he's put together because every filmmaker's trying, I mean, sorry, every theater is built on trying to get their local audiences in. So yep. they're, they're trying to fill up those seats. So mm-hmm. if you're only coming in for the one night, you're right. It's probably, they're like, I can't yep. do that. But if you're coming to answer a bigger problem, you're like, all right, who books you? What can I talk to them? And can I get my title book through them? And that's who you start talking to. Because if, if, if that's, if that's his roadblock, that's the way. Yeah. I would get it Amen. Cause, and then that's just another reason to have a really smart marketing plan. So you can say, this is how I'm going to get, asses and seats here for mm-hmm. you during this slow period yep. for you. And yep. I, I, I love that idea. And by the way, I should just caveat that not all art house theaters or theaters yep. in general have these license deals with, with the Academy of Art Sciences. It's yep. just one of these things you do when, and, they, and 
this theater, I think they said they were grandfathered in. Um, it's just something you do if you want to show a certain type of movie all the time, mm-hmm. you know, uh, January through December. Um, all right, guys, I think it's time <laughs> yep. for things yep. we should know. <laughs> You should. And uh, right. our, our favorite and most terrifying segment of, of the podcast, producer Papa Bear, will you join us and give us a thing we should know? All right. Well, since we have a guest that has a family and business tie to a historic hotel, which we have not discussed yet. It's true. I didn't <laughs> want to put him on Front Street, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's for Papa Bear. Mm-hmm. So, uh, <laughs> well, but, well, maybe, Frank, you could tell us a little bit about that connection uh, before I give what the question is for, for the night. Sure. Yeah. So my family has the one of the longest family-owned hotels in the United States, uh, still one of the largest, uh, that was started in 1886, called the Monteleone Hotel in the heart of the French Quarter. Exactly. And so I thought I would come up with something that was an intersection between hotel and film. Mm. And so uh, let's go for this. This is a kind of a two-parter. The first feature film with the title Hotel was released in 1967. Took that long. Huh? That's amazing. Yep. The film was an adaptation of Arthur Haley's 1965 novel of the same name, Hotel, which featured a fictional Hotel St. Gregory. Here's the question What actual famous hotel was the fictional Hotel St. Gregory based upon? And how many other feature films have since been released with this? The simple title hotel. So the whole title is hotel. The just, whole thing. It's not. Hotel. It's not even it includes. It's not, hotel. It's not hotel, it's just Ro- hotel Rwanda. It's not you know right. hotel fear. It's just okay. hotel. How many? How many films have since been released with the title hotel? Okay, so Nick, I just want to clarify for you that's author. Arthur Haley, not Alex Haley. Right. And <laughs> <laughs> the answer to the first question has to be Frank's Hotel, right? Like it has to be the first part. Like right. it's, it's a layup, right? Like <laughs> he's going to give it to us, right? Right? It's, it's, is that right uh, or wrong, Papa Bear? That's wrong. You yeah. want to know? Uh, Jesus Christ. Who, who that <laughs> novel? He, he's I was going to get it wrong. Us, like, we're not going to know this. You're going to get it wrong, Frank? You, well, yeah. Hold, yeah, Frank, would you have a guess? Yeah. You're, yeah. you're a part-time hoteler or, or part of the yeah, family. Like, yeah. You, yeah. Do you know <laughs> Do you know what uh, the St. Gregory was actually sort of mimicking with hotel? In the who do I have the question right? You're, you're saying there was a title of a movie in 1967 called Hotel. That's correct, and yep. it was based upon an actual historic, actual famous hotel. What hotel was that? Oh, you're saying it was based on a famous hotel, not in the fictional one, and not your hotel. Apparently, yeah, the, yeah, right. the fiction in the in the novel and in the film, it was called Hotel St. Gregory. Arthur Haley based that hotel's character off of an actual hotel. I'm going to guess the Carlisle. Okay. That's a good guess. I have another guess, by the way. There's only, there's only three hotels, by the way, that was in the, like probably in the 1800s. So it's, uh, and the Carlisle was one of them. So I'm guessing it's one of those three. It was Nick, do you have a guess? What are the other two? I have no guess, man. What are the other two? I'm I'm going to guess the St. Regis. Mm-hmm. Good guess. Okay. The actual hotel is about three and a half blocks from Frank's Hotel, the Roosevelt in New Orleans. <gasps> no way. Oh, mm. I'm so mad at that question. (laughs) (laughs) That's why I don't know. (laughs) These are things we should know, Frank. And now it's now you you should know this, and now you know it. And and I don't know how you're going to wield this power in the future. No, I don't need. I've I've consciously (laughs) blocked that out on purpose, and I'll continue. (laughs) And that film was directed by Richard Quine. I don't know if anyone's heard of him or not. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. And okay, what's the second half? I'll know the second. Well, how, how many? many how hotels? many? How many films have been made since then? That just have the name hotel. Just have just the hotel. name hotel. I'm going five because hotel has five letters. <laughs> that's logical. I'm, I'm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, like, that's, that's like when your girlfriend or wife picks the right guess over and over and over again on a football game based on the colors, and you get so pissed off. You're I think the right. blue team's going to win. I study this game. Oh my god! <laughs> and the blue team won. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm going thirteen. What are you going, Frank? I'm going under. I'm going three. Okay, okay. Papa Bear. Well, ding, 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 Chris. Five additional films, a total of six <laughs> <Yeah>. films. <laughs> a total of six. A total uh, of six. He's closed in. He's closed. Five more. That's all. Awesome. I tell you what. Uh, well, wait a second. We already knew one of them was Hotel. I got it right. Yeah. yeah. No, well, he one said of five them was more. the you're one right. in 1967. Yeah. And then no, all, all six of them. No, but your question was how <laughs> many <laughs> more were so technically. How many more he's yeah, right. five, five. were released? Yeah. Uh, there was one in 1981 <laughs> titled Hotel. <laughs> One in 2001, <laughs> one wait, wait, in 2004, <laughs> one in 2013, wow. one in 20, and one just has just come out this year in 2013, um, and it's a comedy. In 2023, you fr- mean? 2023. 2023. It's a comedy out of Iran. <laughs> okay. There you go. The Is it also one, based on the Ruser, the Roosevelt? Roosevelt. <laughs> all of these had all of these had their own storyline not based on that one is from india um one is from Volume. italy in mm-hmm. the uk and usa and then one is uh from austria and germany mm. one is from sweden and denmark and then mm, the, the latest one from iran mm. so uh nice and the t- I'll, I'll top it off with a little more information. Okay. A little cherries here. Ooh, he's top Chocolate it off. salt. Yeah, a little amaretto. Movies on the that have the word hotel <laughs> yeah. in their title. Salt Bay. And it might be like Hotel Rwanda yeah. mm-hmm. or Hotel Fear. Um, there's been hotel 41 of those. Yeah. There's been 41. 41 TV series with the word hotel in their title. 26. TV series have had mm. the word hotel. Well, let me title. tell you something here, producer. <laughs> Pablo. Let me tell you something, Nick. No other podcast is talking about this today. I know <laughs> no. that. No, I know that <laughs> we're it. If we hear somebody talking about <laughs> hotels, hotel movies and TV shows. We know they're totally yeah. swagger jacking us. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But I don't know. Oh, oh, that's right. hundred percent. But fortunately yes, I don't we're think we're going to have this. to worry about that, sir. I'll tell you what. <laughs> no, we'll see. I think, I think we'll see, we're good. We'll see. <laughs> Here's one more hotel thing. Are you kidding Frank, me? Frank. <laughs> He's got actually, another one. Well, Frank will actually know this. Okay. Maybe all three of you. Mm-hmm. What New York city hotel is the most filmed hotel. Oh, uh, jeepers. Uh, it's got to be the I, Waldorf I I Astoria. Got to be, right? Waldorf Astoria? I'm going to guess the plaza. Ooh, that's a good guess. I was going to go Trump Tower, man. Oh. Like, it's one of those, like, one of the Trump hotels. Like, well, see, I, I was right. Frank did know this. It is the plaza. Frank's there the man. Go. Classic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Change his name no, to Frank White. Freaking. Papa yeah. Bear's the man because he knew that Frank was going to get it and we would get it wrong. Well, Producer Papa Bear, thank <laughs> you. The plaza had yeah. North by Northwest, Sleepless in Seattle, even Ooh. though it's in New York, The Great Gatsby, mm. and Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. Yep, yeah, Lost in New York. Wow. Yeah. And that one did have, that one did, yeah, that, that Trump was in Home Alone 2. That's right. Lost in yeah, New York. So that's he a was. so bring it all the yeah. way back to Trumpy. <laughs> So the he, orange one. He was in the hotel. He was in the, the orange, orange ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no shout out to Trump, but you know, thanks right. for all the entertainment. Trump is like when OJ Simpson yeah. showed up in those naked gun movies. It's like, God <laughs> dang, man, you're so good in those damn movies. Why'd you have to he kill those people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could have been yeah, you could have yeah. been the <laughs> next like he's <laughs> hilarious. He's the next red yeah, fox. Just, right. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> he was hilarious. He was no, hilarious and he no, blew it. No. Let me no. ask Frank a I'm question sure real quick before I leave you. Yeah. Uh, is it is it correct that you're planning on making a film about your hotel, your family hotel? Yes, we are. We are currently in development for a series, actually, Heck yeah. a TV series based on our yeah the the centerpiece okay. of the hotel. 
in the French Fantastic. Court. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. Right. That's going to be dope. Yeah. I yeah. love that. Cool. And I will visit it when I make my virgin trip to the French Quarter there to New Orleans, New yeah. Orleans, whatever. <laughs> how, how should I be saying? How should I be saying it? Because I'm terrible at pronunciation. Nolans, bro. Nolans. Okay, good. <laughs> Everybody on this podcast, this audience yeah, knows sure, I yeah. mispronounce things more than anyone, and and have no apologies for it. I'm right so there. that's awesome. Thank you, producer Papa Bear. Uh, that was an incredible yeah, appreciation. Things we should know. Uh, the That's most right. fun and frustrating segment on the Make It podcast, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, That's beautiful. That's that's perfect. Yeah, that well, fr- I love well, it. well, Frank, I, I, I tell you what, what what else is perfect has been this conversation. I've just enjoyed having you on, Nick. I know you feel the same way. Do you have anything yeah, uh, to leave us with, Nick? Uh, you, any any last questions for Frank before we? Uh, no, leave no, him? man. Because because here's the well, here's the for danger. Round one right here. here, exactly. You and I are having so much fun that we could just continue going. Like, and I know that like we got to do save some more for a round two. So I don't have any more questions. All I got to do is just say thank you, man. This has been awesome. We appreciate you. Like, this has been a great conversation. And like I said before, it's all about making new friends in this awesome, amazing industry that we're in. And, and we really do feel like we made a new one tonight. So it's awesome. Yeah. It's good to see you. Good to have no, you. No, man, same here. You got, like I said, when I got on it, you got a lifer in me. You guys, you hit on all the spots. This was this was great. I'd be happy to, uh, to do it again. Seriously, you guys are, I love it. I love everything you got going. All right, thanks, man. That awesome. means the world Appreciate to us. You, and, and before you get out of here, can you tell everybody listening where they can find you on social media, find you on the internet, see some of your work, uh, anything you want to share? Yeah. Uh, so Full Armor Films is our uh, company. It's fullarmorfilms.com. Uh, we're on social, on um, Instagram, just under Full Armor Films, uh, X, all that stuff. And then um, have a YouTube page. And then personally, I'm Frank J. Monteleon. So, you know, I'm not all a Instagram and stuff like that. You can see our personal stuff up there, but um, yeah, look forward to come check it out. We got American reject that just came out. We got some films coming out and um, this next year that we're excited about. So yeah, beautiful. I'm down here, in New here. Orleans, make some movies. Awesome. Well, <laughs> Hey man, I'll, yeah. we'll definitely be down there uh, pretty soon. It's on, it's on the bucket list and, and uh, here, here. Uh, yeah. If you're listening to this, watching this, do it. Do what Frank says. Go check out his movie, American Reject, that just came out. Follow him, support him. He's a, a real independent filmmaker trying to do his thing out in the world. And uh, this audience and, and this show is all about putting your money where your mouth is and actually supporting these creators that just enrich and make our lives better. You know where to find them on social, at Instagram, on X, at full, uh, let's see, make sure I get this full armor films. That's A-R-M-O-R, or is it spelled the English way? No, the <laughs> United the States way. Yeah. A-R-M-O-R. <laughs> yeah. M-O-R. Okay. So with the, yeah. without the U film. Yeah. So go check them out. You can find us at underscore make it podcast on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook by just searching for make it podcast. You can find us on X at underscore make it podcast. We are uploading full episodes to, uh, to X now. Uh, you can find us on YouTube. All you have to do is search for make it podcast. We will come right up. The YouTube page is just, uh, just there's a cornucopia of That's content right. there, there short go. form, long form <laughs> stuff for you to dig your teeth into, dig your claws into as a as a filmmaker. If you want to reach out to Nick directly, you can email him at Nick at Bonsai dot film. That's B O N S A I dot film. Let him know what you think about perspective being upside down on his T-shirt for those that are watching. Let them know if you hate that or love that. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can find me on X at flame in your heart. You're spelled you are, or you can just type in Chris Barkley. I will come right up and we respond to 100% of those messages. Last but not least, go to bonsai.film forward slash subscribe to subscribe to our free newsletter. We put it out every two weeks. Uh, we compile things from all around the world of film, the esoteric, the things you can't find and put it all in one spot for you, uh, so that it's, uh, easy for you to be on top of what's coming around the corner, uh, in film outside of sort of listening to us talk on this podcast. So with that long diatribe, I will hand it over to Nick to leave us with the credo. Thing. When he starts talking like that, I'm like, my mouth gets back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I have to say to all of our filmmaking friends, uh, fans and family out there, be better, be creative, 
be engaged. And thank you for listening. Nick, Frank, talk to you guys soon. Yeah, man, we'll do it again. All right. Be good. Yeah. Thanks, fellas. Peace. Appreciate you. You've been listening to the Make It Podcast. For more information about this episode, please visit our website at www.banzai.film. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our podcast on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts by searching for Make It Bonsai Creative, and the show will pop right up. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at underscore Bonsai Creative, and on Facebook and LinkedIn by searching for Make It Bonsai Creative. In addition, you can provide feedback to us via email at contact at bonsai.film. You now have the opportunity to support the production of this podcast. If you love Make It and are a true fan of what we are trying to accomplish in the indie film community, please consider supporting our Patreon page. We spend a combined 35 hours a week producing each episode. We do this with a small team of go-getters that are passionate about film and connecting people with similar interests across the globe. And we have lots of goodies in store for our supporters, including bonus content, exclusive swag, and discounts and freebies to private film events. If that sounds like something you can get behind, donations start at only $5 monthly. And of course, If you're looking to take a big step toward your film's financial success, go to www.banzai.film and click on services to explore our unrivaled approach to film marketing. You have everything to gain. Until next time, be better, be creative, be engaged, and thank you for listening.